Welcome, welcome, everybody. Uh, it is a really bright, sunny day out, and I uh, apologize for a little bit of the, the video. The sun is just blasting through my, my window here, um, so hopefully you can still see okay. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Keith Stickley. Uh, I'm an attorney. Uh, I'm currently actually in my office in uh, Royal Oak, Michigan, uh, suburb of Detroit, and I have been involved in the uh, the outdoor entertainment industry uh, for quite a long time. Um, just a, cu a couple of quick things, and whenever I go to these kind of sessions, I, I'm always like sitting there going, okay, so why is this person talking and, and why should I care? Uh, so just kind of a, a brief synopsis. Uh, I'm an attorney, but that's my um, sort of my third career before I got into a law and established uh, the Stickley Law Firm. Uh, I was actually an entertainer. Uh, I was an entertainment full-time. I was a magician and comedian, trying to hold that against me. And hopefully tonight or this afternoon will be uh, kind of uh, kind of funny and engaging and I won't put you all to sleep. Um, I did that for a long time, uh, toured the world, cruise ships and resorts, that kind of thing. And then uh, got into the, uh, the the carnival and circus business through um, a, uh, a touring show I have called the Great American Sideshow Company. It's one of the last touring sideshow, circus sideshows in the, in the country. And we tour uh, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois. And so uh, if you're looking for uh, for something exciting uh, for your event there, a uh, quick shameless plug, uh, check us out. I'll show you the, the website or whatever. Um, but um, I had a, a chance to uh, kind of make a major career shift that I was, always wanted to be an attorney. Uh, I got a, a pretty substantial scholarship to law school. And so here I am. So I'm still involved in the entertainment uh, and event industry. And, uh, and and I'm running a law firm. And one of the most common things that has been kind of blowing up my my phone lately, obviously, is what liability issues um, do some of uh, our, our festivals and events, uh, as well as our carnival operators and entertainment providers, have with this whole the whole COVID situation? Uh, I've been honored to to work with the uh, with the MFEA. Um, as uh, as kind of house counsel on, on several different projects, so they asked me to come in and and speak about this. And um, I, just a couple of caveats I, I have to because I am an attorney. Um, you know, this presentation is for for informational purposes. It's not formal legal advice. Everybody's situation obviously is different. Um, and quite frankly, with the whole COVID nineteen situation, uh, a lot of things that I talk about this morning are uh, are in flux, and I don't I don't they're my opinion, they're in flux, and I don't know that they'll necessarily be the case in uh, five or six months from now, um, just because the rapid, um, the rapid both uh, education and health situation as far as things uh, evolve, uh, as well as sort of the political climate, because a lot of liability and things that we're going to be talking about uh, have a very, um, uh, a very strong kind of political component, as I'm sure you're all aware. So, um, you know, obviously we don't have to recap everything that's going on with COVID, right? COVID is terrible. It's ravaging the nation, depending on the, who you talk to about the severity. One thing that, that everybody can agree on uh, when it comes to this thing is um, what it's done to our past events and the fear and uncertainty that it's thrown into all of our future events. Uh, and one of as, as an entertainment producer and, and somebody who works at events and, and works with events, one of the main uh, things that's, that's often asked is, what is our exposure to liability um, by holding events or holding events going forward? In other words, um, what is your liability exposure to anybody who works with you or maybe volunteers with you in your organization while you're, while you're producing an event? Uh, or what is the liability exposure that you, your event might have uh, to people who are coming to your event. And those are kind of two separate distinct things, um, but I'm gonna try to address them um, as clearly as possible. I also wanna encourage anybody who has a question uh, about anything that comes up, go ahead and just drop the question in the chats right there. I'd be more than happy to, uh, to diverge and kind of answer anything that I can. In general, when we talk about liability, obviously we're all familiar with things like, you know, event insurance and and safety. And we sort of have a, a moral and legal obligation to make our events um, as safe as, uh, you know, as we possibly can. But there's no such thing as a completely safe uh, event. Every time we leave our house, you know, we're at risk of something, you know, a car could 
wh whatever. I don't even have to go there, but you know what it is. Um, with COVID, it's a little bit different, right? We have this invisible virus that takes uh, up to 14 days, maybe 21 days to fully incubate, run its course, develop. And because it's a pandemic, you don't really know where it's going to come from next. All right. So how do we protect ourselves from liability as an event when we don't really know where the threat is coming from? Uh, well, the, the, the hard answer to that question is we really don't. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that we, we still probably owe some sort of a duty to try and keep our events as safe as we possibly can and shield us from liability. So uh, live events are a different beast. And what, what complicates this thing even further is that most of the events that I, I'm sure you are all involved with uh, and, and that my entertainment company goes to as well are all outdoor events, right? Um, so some of our main concerns are, uh, you know, are our events going to become super spreader events? Uh, how are we going to handle sanitation? And uh, do we have any sort of ongoing government interference that could affect our liability and what actions that we take. Now, traditionally, I'm sure everybody who's, who's been involved in an event uh, knows that, you know, there's certain rules and guidelines you have to adhere to. Many events have to have, especially if there's any sort of portable, um, you know, buildings or structures, you have to have, you know, fire department approval. Uh, food vendors have to have things like food, uh, you know, sanitation. Um, if your food vendors have an STFU, a special transitory food unit, you know, some of those need to be inspected and whatnot. And a lot of those have changed. A lot of those guidelines have changed um, in this whole COVID thing. Um, but so as long as, you know, the, the, the common the common understanding was as long in Michigan, especially as as long as you follow those guidelines, relatively um, insured against liability, unless there was some act of gross negligence, right? Basically some purposeful or absolutely uh, crazy action that somebody took on behalf of, of an event or whatever that would cause somebody a liability. Uh, what would that be? I don't know. Something like, uh, you know, uncovered electrical connections or, or, you know, something of the like, but that's not what we're dealing with here. And that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it so difficult. Because of this, uh, and, and by the way, nationwide, right? Michigan's a little bit different in this in this aspect, but nationwide, there are what are called plaintiff attorneys, uh, sort of the, the slip and fall guys, if you will, who are sort of running rampant, trying to sue everybody for everything, right? They basically know that you have some form of liability insurance, and their goal is to try and get that liability insurance money. That's sort of that's sort of how the whole liability insurance game works. Um, you uh, your your insurance policy is sort of the carrot that dangles out there, and those guys want that carrot because that's how they make their living by their big houses and airplanes and all the fun stuff. Uh, so our goal is to try and make ourselves a small enough target. Uh, that we don't have to be borrowed with, uh, bothered with those guys. Because the fact of the matter is, if somebody starts suing your event uh, or or your various people involved in your event uh, for some kind of liability, even if you win, this can be a really expensive proposition. Uh, you still have to hire a defense counsel or your insurance has to hire defense counsel and insurance premiums are going to go up. And Quite frankly, the insurance companies, my understanding is in some of the insurance companies that I've talked to, they don't want to deal with that either, right? They're really interested in limiting liability. So let's talk about a couple of COVID specific things. Um, there has been a growing movement actually um, in the federal government. Um, quite frankly, uh, recently, I think in late late summer, early fall, spearheaded by uh, Mitch McConnell uh, and, and the Senate, they're, they're trying to get some sort of federal uh, COVID-19 business immunity. And uh, what that would do was basically block any type of liability-based lawsuits uh, for people who are trying to bring lawsuits claiming that they are, um, that they were negligently uh, somehow caught COVID from various businesses. Um, state legislatures have been grapp grappling with this too. I think there's five or six different states uh, where their state legislatures have now uh, passed uh, some type of COVID-19, excuse me, uh, business support legislation that 
would sort of preclude being sued based upon that. And Michigan's one of them. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to delve into that here in a couple of minutes. Um, the, the, the Senate has been, I, I think it's from Bill. Uh, and I, uh, if I get technical here, I apologize uh, if, it, if it bores you a little bit, but you can Google some of the stuff as well. But um, the Senate introduced, um, I think the uh, safe work act, I think it was, uh, it was Senate bill uh, 4317, which shielded small businesses uh, from immunity. Now, no action uh, has been taken on that yet. And um, just as much as as many businesses are are pushing for some sort of immunity uh, to shield them from COVID liability, uh, there's a a lot of organizations that are pushing back against it. I think, uh, was it uh, Consumers Protection something is is one of them. Um, The thought being... Look, if if people are out of out of pocket, COVID wise, right? Why should they give up their ability to uh, you know to bring claims? Uh, and is that really fair? So, kind of, what is the what's the that, that's on the federal level? We'll, we'll talk to the state level. So, we'll talk about the state of Michigan and how the state of Michigan handles things. Uh, currently, um, just I think within the last two weeks. Uh, the state of Michigan um, actually passed some legislation. Governor Granholm signed it uh, into law. Uh, a lot of people think that this is a fail-safe uh, protection uh, that maybe our industry can take advantage of. And I'm going to caution you, I'm not entirely sure that that's the case. Uh, again, this is just an opinion. But um, we actually... Our Michigan legislature put forth, uh, I think it was House Bill 6030 and 6031. They were signed into uh, into law by Granholm. And let me see if I can actually, I think I can actually share this with you guys. Hang on a second. Okay, that's uh, 236. And I'll post the links here, by the way, if anybody is interested in actually delving into this stuff. Um and, and seeing what it is, but for right now, I think I can do this. Uh, this bill right here um, is basically designed to shield business owners from COVID liability, COVID-19 claims, in the event that all other um, laws, guidelines, and restrictions have been followed. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the, the problem with that is, as of right now, I believe that this legislation is a little bit um, ambiguous as to uh, how, what exact guidelines uh, need to be followed. Uh, obviously, we know that we had the big constitutional challenges of the governor, um, and it sort of went down. Her emergency powers were revoked, and uh, they said that, you know, power needs to be restored back to the legislature. Uh, And then the governor, uh, I believe through her executive branch, um, the uh, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services decided that they had the authority to go forward and and issue certain directives. Well, where do those directives fit within the confines of this bill to shield you from liability? That's a good question. Unfortunately, I think we are going to still see litigation about that. And I think what's going to happen is the attorneys who want to bring this kind of litigation are going to argue that uh, this bill is is too, um, it's not narrowly tailored enough to truly provide the kind of protection that uh, that we need. Um, so House Bill 6, 6030, just so you know, this here. Uh, prevents um, it is aimed to prevent uh, our customers, our patrons coming to our events uh, from suing the event itself, uh, or potentially any any of those patrons suing the vendors themselves. And again, it's only if uh, all the rules and guidelines, uh, whatever they might be at the moment, uh, are adhered to. Now, that's only one half of the puzzle, right? no fair festival event anything operates sort of in a vacuum without uh, a massive amount of volunteers you know potentially employees contractors anything like that so a question i'm often asked is how do we is there a liability factor between the event itself and those contractors and quite frankly yeah there is And the legislature has recently tried to enact uh, legislation again that was signed by Granholm 
uh, to try and shield some of that. And I think I can, let me see if I can bring that up as well. I think I can, uh, maybe, hang on a minute. And that would have been in, that would have been in House Bill uh, 6031. This is a, a very, very similar bill to 630. But what this does is this is, is attempting to shield liability between employee and the actual employer situation. So if you have, uh, you, you know, if you have a staff that uh, is working on your event and the staff, you know, claims that, well, just in the normal course of working on your event, they somehow contracted COVID-19, um, they may be barred from bringing a liability claim uh, against your employer. Well, both of these things, a lot of people are like, well, well, what has to be, what has to be done in order to provide that, what has to be proven, I should say, in order to provide somebody the right to sue somebody else? Well, the problem we have with COVID-19, obviously, is we have this long incubation period. Think about this. How many people do you come in contact with on a weekly basis, just in your everyday life, right? Um, in a single day, right? I mean, you go to the grocery store, you go to the gas station, you go to, you know, wherever. We are no longer a, a, a society that uh, that just goes out to the grocery store once a week or goes out to eat once a week. I mean, this is a constant thing and it's constant even through COVID. So multiply that by 10 to 14 days and your amount of, of exposure points, even with all the protection protocols that we have in place are massive. In order to be sued based on liability successfully, you generally need to establish a nexus, okay, a, a, tr a connection between alleged activity and the actual sickness or cause of harm. And when you have this wide variation, that can sometimes be next to next to impossible. But that doesn't mean that that people don't uh, that people don't try. And when you're suing for liability. Unlike the criminal courts where you have to pr prove something beyond a reasonable doubt, right? I mean, that's, you know, basically the, the highest threshold you can have is, you know, pretty darn close to 100%. When it comes to civil liability, it's important to remember that they only have to uh, prove uh, basically a preponderance of the evidence usually, right? 51, 52% that it probably did happen or more likely than not happened. And uh, that's where you get in trouble. So uh, I highly encourage you, uh, if you are dealing with uh, and you are planning, you know, events going forward, uh, take these two bills here, basically, if you have a legal counsel or maybe even do your insurance provider and you say, hey, look, where do you think, um, you know, where do you think we fit into the confines of this and what is our exposure to liability? And I'll go ahead and put the links to those here right now. I think I can do that. I think I'm technologically sophisticated enough to figure this out. There's the one. And here is the other. I also highly encourage you. I know it's really dry reading and it's governmental stuff, but I encourage you to take kind of 20 minutes out of your, uh, you know, out of your day and your planning and actually go through these and uh, kind of, kind of, you know, take a good look at them and, and see what might be there. Um, so in, in, in regards to these, uh, you know, bills that were, that were put out, um, you know, I know the Michigan chamber of commerce, uh, was, was largely instrum instrumental and supportive in, uh, in getting some of this passed because, um, you know, I, I see quite frankly, liability being the, one of the main, uh, things that, um, inhibits our sort of our economy and our growth and especially in our industry going forward uh, because we're not selling physical tangible goods that we can get direct to consumer right it's really hard to have uh, meaningful entertainment events without gathering people I mean it's we're in a live entertainment medium right and there's no there's no such thing as eliminating the risk. I mean, I think in that one of the other breakout sessions right now, with my good buddy uh, Doug Birch is giving is is how to handle you know a social unrest, you know, at an event. All these things can happen. Live events are dynamic events, and you're not going to eliminate risk, right? It's 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 absolutely unheard of. 
So some of the most important things that we have to do and, and take into account are how can we just basically limit that? Um, just a heads up as well, uh, to seek to get protection from uh, from the bill 630, uh, 6030 and 6031, uh, you're going to want to follow and really go in depth with your local uh, your local health departments because your local health departments, according to the Constitution of the state of Michigan, do have local health officers. They do have the right to issue uh, very specific guidelines. Uh, in order to try and preserve the health and the safety of, uh, of, of your event. So that comes directly into play if you're going to uh, try to use some of this leg legislation to limit your, your liability risk you know, going forward. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a wild, crazy world out there. We don't really know what's going to happen uh, when it comes to, to contract law and, and liability. Um, the crazy part is, is for the first, for the first time, I think in a lot of people's, you know, adult life, they're seeing the whole, you know, the whole God clause or the, the act of God, um, you know, sort of come into play and we're trying to figure out, you know, wow, this really is kind of the, the ultimate parachute, um, you know, that, that we're dealing with. Does anybody have any questions yet? Let me just take a quick break here. Uh, about liability, or has anybody here been questioned uh, or asked about uh, you know any liability issues as far as as far as going forward, or maybe had any employment claims? And, and please don't use names if you have. But um, if you have, go ahead and drop it in the comments right there, and maybe we can uh, maybe we can address them because I think I think somebody had messaged me before regarding it. I don't know if anybody's there or not. There might be a time delay on this too. I won't take a long time. No? Okay. Everybody's sleeping. I hypnotized everybody, apparently. All right. So here's the scoop on this. Um, I also wanted to talk about another form of protection. Uh, I've been talking with a couple other attorneys. Oh, no issues. All groups, committees that were just canceled for fear of liability. Okay. Uh, Lisa Edwards, our insurance company dropped us from hosting events until the end of the year, and we had to apply for a special policy. And is, the, is that the new norm? Um, I, <laughs> I hope that it's not the new norm. And the thing is, insurance companies are, I better be careful because I don't know who will end up watching this. I have a love-hate relationship uh, with, with a lot of liability insurance companies. And when I say I have a love-hate relationship with them, I think I love to hate them. I think that's kind of how it, it comes out. Um, they tend to be, and this is personal opinion, so don't uh, don't attack me, but they tend to be, um, you think an insurance company would worry about safety and risk, and really it has nothing to do with safety and risk. It's uh, you pay us the premium and uh, we take zero of the risk. That's, that's sort of the mind frame that they operate from. And yes, I think unfortunately for a while, that is going to be the new norm. I think that you are going to have to be getting different special carriers. Um, and I think in addition to that, I foresee a lot of insurance policies moving forward, which I'm not sure why they don't already anyway. But in the face of legislation that we were just talking about, like 6030 and 6031, I think you're going to start seeing um, COVID exemptions. In other words, uh, we'll issue this. You will issue you this insurance policy. However, if there are any claims related to, you know, COVID nineteen, uh, we are not. We're specifically not going to insure that. I'm hoping what happens is cooler heads prevail, and end up saying, okay, look, uh, there is an exemption carved in a lot of these insurance policies. However, there are some state uh, precautions that uh, may preclude that from really being real uh, or really being a real threat. Uh, whether that is good enough for the insurance industry uh, and for people moving forward, you know, I, I'm really not sure. Uh, I'll say something I think is a little bit controversial, uh, but, but I truly believe it. And that is a lot of people, I believe, are using COVID as an excuse to not do things more than 
a legitimate excuse or a legitimate rational fear um, of, of, of getting it or infecting somebody else. I'm not in any way downplaying the actual risk. I'm not a medical doctor. I only know I have access to the same information as they, that you do. I see what I see on the TV. I see, you know, I see what I read. Um, but one alarming thing that I have noticed is that a lot of folks, especially in the, in the live event and the, the community event thing is maybe as they get a little bit older and it's difficult to bring younger people into the fray. Um, one, some of the older committees, uh, they maybe have some conditions, you know, health conditions and whatever. So they do have legitimate fear. But number two, I think a lot of people see it as a good way of just sort of getting out of it. It's kind of a, it's kind of an excuse. Um, I could tell you in other business arrangements, it's really hard to get employees right now because of COVID. Uh, it's difficult to get employees to show up and, and stimulate the economy when the legislature has uh, pumped so much basically fake cash into the economy. And, uh, and because of that, uh, there's not a real incentive to work. Um, so that, that is sort of a, that's sort of a major issue. I think I have somebody trying to uh, come up in a panel here. I'm going to bring somebody in real quick for a question. Let's see. Did that work? Oh, maybe not. Oh, I think somebody was trying to get on a video to ask a question, but I don't think it worked. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, I, I let's see. Uh, all groups, committees I involved with just cancel for fear li liability. Yeah. So it's a fear-based thing. It's not rational uh, necessarily. Uh, it's a threat that we have to take seriously. But uh, and it's a great unknown, right? Everybody's afraid of of the unknown. The average event that uh, that I've worked with, both on the entertainment side and, and legal side, uh, they're kind of already shielded from a lot of personal liability. Um, you know, if, if if you have like an LLC or a, or some sort of business designation to handle some of that liability, uh, that does shield you. Uh, moving on, I want to talk about um, another aspect of of shielding liability. Um, this doesn't necessarily make non-legal people um, not nervous anymore, but it's something that, I, that are, there are quite a few attorneys in Michigan that I've had a chance to, uh, that I've had a chance to powwow with. And we've, we've been uh, kicking around. Some of you might be uh, aware of this. Michigan has an interesting law, an interesting doctrine, a uh, set of guidelines, if you will, called the open and obvious doctrine. And the open and obvious doctrine is basically a, a a doctrine or a set of a set of rules that that say if a dangerous condition at an event or a business is um, if it if it's open and obvious if it's apparent to people going to the event or around something that there is a dangerous condition the most popular one being uh, if it's winter in Michigan and there's ice in a parking lot um, then that business may be automatically shielded. Uh, from liability. All right. Now, again, this is mainly due to this is mainly brought about because of Michigan's, uh, you know, weather, we have extreme weather cycles, be it tons of rain, tons of ice, tons of snow, whatever. And it, an interesting thing for those of you who travel quite a bit, sometimes you go down to Florida, I, I go down to Florida quite a bit. And every other billboard you see is some sort of a personal injury lawyer talking about a slip and fall. And then you come back back up to Michigan, and you don't really see that. And the reason is, is this open and obvious doctrine. Uh, so that, that begs the question, if businesses can be protected from uh, lawsuits because some of these threats are open and obvious, does that extend, does the open and obvious ex, uh, doctrine extend to, um, to COVID potentially? And is that another way that we can, is that another legal defense if we have our events and somebody brings a COVID claim that we can enact? Um, I am not yet aware of any uh, lawsuits in Michigan that have used that as a defense. But I do know that a lot of attorneys are sort of sitting around going, hmm, this might be another kind of tool in our arsenal to help protect uh, our business clients uh, from some of these lawsuits. So the, it begs the question, well, is COVID-19 open and obvious? Well, 
let's see, we've been locked down since March. Uh, we're currently in a, a mask mandate type situation. Uh, there's rules, there's been rules regarding where you can go, who you can assemble with, what you can do for the past, what are we on month, uh, three to 11, eight months. Uh, you don't go anywhere without seeing face shields. Um, the state highway department has put on all those information driving signs, mask up, you know, when you're out in public, um, we now have, uh, co quote unquote contract tact tracing at, at our restaurants. I, I think we're supposed to sign in with a, a number or whatever, uh, taking all those things into account, uh, would anybody not know, would it not be obvious that we're in the middle of a pandemic? I would argue that it's completely obvious that we're that we're in a pandemic, that there is a threat that if you go out and you interact with other human beings, that they're you're taking an inherent risk. And because of that, um, my personal belief is that that COVID-19 should be included in the in the open and obvious doctrine and that protections should have been in place before even this specific legislation was enacted um, to, to try and protect businesses. Now, when I brought this up to another group, actually, two, uh, about two weeks ago, and they said, yeah, but unlike, unlike ice in a parking lot or something like that, COVID can't be seen. And uh, there is case law on point. There's been, been decisions and case law on point that um, like black ice or ice covered by snow, even if you can't actually see the threat of, of ice that would have you fall and slip and potentially hurt yourself, um, the, you know, because you're in Michigan, we've all lived here, we've experienced winters and whatever, you know that the conditions are absolutely ripe uh, to have some sort of a, a condition that, that might cause an injury. I would argue that the exact same thing applies to COVID, right? We know the conditions are ripe. We know that uh, there's airborne, you know, airborne and mucus transmission, you know, of this virus. Uh, you can't turn off the television or the radio, or you can't read anything without hearing about it. So um, the, the open and obvious doctrine specifically does kind of address that if the danger was effectively, uh, uh, if, it, if it was effectively avoidable, then that doctrine should protect you. And I think in our live events, I think COVID is, I think a strong argument can be made, <coughs> excuse me, that COVID is avoidable by simply not going to the event. Um, and it sort of boggles my mind as to why that's not a, that's not a thing. There are people with compromised immunity uh, and such that know they are at a greater susceptible to catching something. And if they catch something, it could be, you know, it could be not good. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it only makes sense to me uh, that those people would, uh, you know, not go to those events. Um, this might present a little bit of a difficult challenge on events that are like open street fair events as opposed to uh, ticketed events where you have to go to something. You know, maybe you get just a normal person walking through uh, and they might have a different kind of a claim if they're not really an event uh, invitee or uh, yeah, invitee of the event. But um, these are all things that are getting ironed out right now. I personally, and I'm just going out on a personal limb here, I personally I understand. I think it's very disappointing, but I understand the the apprehension of of not in not wanting to hold events due to liability in 2020. I get it. Um, it's hard to make decisions uh, where other people's safeties are involved uh, when we sort of don't have all the answers. I think that moving forward in 2021. I think we have a lot more answers. I think we have a lot more tools to deal with it. I think the public in general is much more educated on, on the risks, regardless of where, what ideology or political spectrum you're on. Uh, I think everybody knows um, or should know at this point that, um, you know, COVID, it, it's, it's a real thing. It's not some sort of a, a fake boogeyman. Uh, but that being said, oh, excuse me just for a moment. That being said, we cannot, uh, oh, it's, it's a busy morning here. Um, that being said, we can't, uh, you know, we still have a duty to limit 
uh, the amount of exposure or liability or, or potential harm to our, our guests and our patrons as, uh, as we have. So, yeah, I think this thing is here to stay. I think it's not going to go away uh, immediately. I think we're going to have to adjust uh, so that we limit our liability. Um, I could tell you there's a couple of great, uh, absolutely great resources that have been put out. I know one was just put out by the OABA. And in fact, I think I can, uh, I'm going to share this with you guys, both the link and um, I'm going to put the link right here. Uh, and I highly, highly encourage you to uh, take a look at that. I think uh, I think Sonia uh, Skirbeck actually shared that in uh, in the main reception, but I've shared it with a couple other clients as well. And it's a really, really nice interactive guide uh, that the OABA put out. It's in PDF form, and uh, while it's while it's sort of um, carnival specific, I can tell you going through this thing. This is a really, really, really good guide, practical guide, uh, as far as keeping your event uh, as safe as possible. Um, they put a lot of a lot of effort and research into this, and I think that in our sort of litigious society that, that we have, um, I think that if you had the chance to uh, share some of this. Um, uh, share some of this information or, or if you ever were accused of somehow being liable, but you were following some of these, these industry standard events, uh, it can only help quite frankly. Uh, so uh, that's, like I said, I think that's a really important, uh, that's a really important thing. I think we only have a couple of minutes left here and uh, I have to get off to a, uh, a another conference here, but uh, if anybody has any other questions, go ahead and uh, go ahead and drop them down below and uh, if you're looking for a on a, on a on a way more fun note, if you're looking for a, a fun uh, circus a sideshow event, your event uh, coming up, uh, we'd be happy to uh, come out. Go ahead and check us out at uh, the Great American Sideshow. Uh, it's a heck of it's a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, shameless plug right there. Um, it's a good time. Uh, vintage vintage fun for the family. I think we have a question here. Somebody just. Uh, Somebody just texted me a question here. That's kind of funny how that worked through. Oh, I guess it's on something else. All right. Well, that being said, guys, uh, look, it was a real honor to be invited to come out here. The MFEA is really doing great work. Um, hopefully, I'll be able to, to work with you guys um, and the board uh, quite a bit in the future. If anybody has any questions at all uh, or has any liability concerns that come up uh, for MFEA members, uh, I'm more than willing to sit down and, and have a, a telephone, you know, con consultation, conversation, um, you know, not a problem whatsoever. Uh, the outdoor entertainment industry has, uh, you know, it's provided uh, me with an incredible life and uh, I just, I love it. And so anything I can do to, to, to give back in my, my position, I'm more than happy to do so. So I'm going to go ahead and put my, uh, give you guys my direct office number here in the chat. It's 248-246-0607. Uh, you can also uh, reach me at uh, Keith at uh, put this down here, Keith at Stickley Law Firm uh, dot com, and uh, that's about it. So, if you guys don't have any other questions or anything, uh, that's about it for now. I'm not exactly sure how. Oh, I guess I can just click the little leave button. That'll work right there. Thanks so much, guys. Have a great rest of the virtual convention, and we will uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.